Okay, let's uh, get started in this next next half of the first uh, panel three on the question of World War Three or the global renaissance. During the last uh, panel, there was a question asked, what was the role of Prince Philip of the Crown and so forth uh, in, this, uh, in this whole terrorism issue? Uh, addressing that issue on the question of who is sponsoring international terrorism, I'd like to welcome uh, our CEC reach researcher, uh, Glenn Isherwood, to address that question and uh, give, give you that uh, information. Glenn, it's all yours. Okay, my, I'm all good. All these mics working. Okay. Okay. On 23 September of last year, the Citizens Electoral Council issued a media release entitled is British SIS ASIO planning a terrorist attack on Australia? That release began like this. As things presently stand, a near-term terrorist attack upon Australian soil is almost guaranteed. Why? Is it because there are so many terrorists out there, whether homegrown or returning from Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan or elsewhere, such that at least one lone wolf is bound to slip through? No. It is because the British Crown and the City of London, which control the British and Australian intelligence services, intend for such an attack to occur. And right on cue, legislation now pending in the Australian Parliament will grant virtual immunity to any Australian officials who orchestrate or participate in such an attack. So, less than three months later, December 15th, the so-called Sydney siege erupts. Three people are killed, four wounded. We have published some crucial facts which show that the Sydney crime was orchestrated by British and Australian intelligence agencies, and we are going to be publishing more evidence of that soon. How could we forecast a so-called terrorist attack with such certainty? It's because we understand the global strategic situation pivoted upon the certainty of a new and far worse global financial crash. And because we knew of the nature of the entity whose very existence would be called into question by a new outbreak of a financial crisis, the British Empire. What British Empire? Didn't it go out of existence long ago? That's what we've been told, particularly since the end of World War II. But take a closer look. Red coats have gone out of fashion, and the old British Navy gunboats may still sail the sea, may not sail the seas, but the British imperialists themselves and the Queen herself, on one occasion back in the 1970s, have sometimes ever so quietly slipped that the idea of indirect rule is much more effective and much more less likely to arouse opposition than redcoats and gunboats. 1995, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, also known as Chatham House, issued a report entitled Economic Opportunities for Britain and the Commonwealth. It identified, quote, an informal financial empire, end quote, as the new form of imperial rule. Chatham House also specified Australia's intended place within that empire as the bridgehead and staging ground for British control of Asia. Now, some dumb American collaborators of this British imperial policy are more into the limelight today with the old methods of military domination such as with the Asia Pivot doctrine of British stooge Obama. In yesterday's discussion, Helga LaRouche noted that Australia's assigned role in the Asia Pivot scheme is that of a giant aircraft carrier for war with China. 
In today's informal financial empire, the British crown sits at its apex, along with about 200 old oligarchical families as even academic studies of the British elite document. There are a lot of hangers-on who have been dubbed Knights of the Garter, members of the Order of the British Empire, Knights, Commanders of St Michael and St George, and so forth. The British intelligence agencies report to the Crown, which also rules through the City of London and Wall Street, along with such fronts as the IMF, the World Bank, and the European Central Bank. Just remember what even the standard history books recount about the mass ge genocide committed by the British Empire in the 19th century, which was only yesterday in historical terms. Tens of millions of people killed by systemic starvation in India, millions killed in Ireland by the forcible export of food, even during the potato famine, and millions of Chinese killed during the opium wars or poison. Today, the informal financial empire is doing the same thing. Just look at the spiraling death, death rates in Europe under the brutal role of the European Union, an institution engineered by British Imperial City of London interests over the last century. Look at the death rates in Africa and large parts of the rest of the so-called developing sector, Ebola, the lack of any functional healthcare systems in West Africa. Now, the Crown itself states that such effects are desirable. Prince Philip has openly proclaimed, for example, to the German press agency in 1988, quote, in the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation, end quote. Queen Elizabeth herself knighted the infamous John Schellenhuber, head of the Potsdam Institute on Climate Impact, who proclaims that the world can only support one to two billion human beings, at most. Remember it was Prince Philip and his World Wildlife Fund was initially organised by two of the most notorious outspoken advocates of the racial purity doctrine called eugenics in the entire 20th century. These were Privy Councillor Secretary Max Nicholson and Sir Julian Huxley, who as the head of UNESCO after World War II, stated openly that the Green Movement's goal was to promote eugenics by other means, given that Hitler had given the term eugenics a bad name. So this British imperialist promotion of mass genocide has always involved religious and other warfare to make sure the victims keep fighting each other and that is achieved by the creation and sponsorship of horrific cults like the Islamic State today and assassinations of leaders who pose an obstacle to that goal and to their rule. Now, the myth says... Sure, the British did those naughty things in the past, and that is ancient history. Surely Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II would never even dream of doing such things. Really. Well, let's take an example close to home, shall we? Um, case of Gough Whitlam. So many years ago, we documented that Prime Minister Whitlam was sacked in 1975 at the express direction of Queen Elizabeth, acting through that notorious toady Sir John Kerr, a long-time MI6 agent and royal sycophant. Since the time of our first publication of that expose in the pamphlet called The Fight for an Australian Republic, much more has been released from official records and other accounts demonstrating beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Queen herself coordinated the entire affair. What was the issue then? Whitlam and his allies like Treasury Secretary Jim Cairns, Minerals and Energy Minister Rex Connor, had grand plans to buy back the farm from the Queen's multinationals. 
Remember, it was Elizabeth II, at least until recently, who owned the largest private share in Rio Tinto. They intended to construct, this is Rex Connor, Jim Cairns and Whitlam, intended to instruct infrastructure projects to really develop our continent. Now, because we're in the British Commonwealth, it didn't take three sharpshooters on a grassy knoll to get rid of Whitlam's uh, plans and leadership. Under our parliamentary system, easily destabilised, the Queen could direct Whitlam's assassination, so to speak, through judicial means. Now, does that sound shocking? Well, compare what Whitlam and old Labor had planned for the country with the free trade, deregulated, privatised nightmare it has become after its outster, except for positive elements contributed in the interregnum under Malcolm Fraser as Robbie reported yesterday. Is it not identical to what happened to the change in direction forced upon the United States after the assassination of President Kennedy? This background is vital to understand because the greatest obstacle to the answer to the question in the title of my presentation, who is sponsoring international terrorism, is actually the willful blindness on the nature of the British crown. If you think that the crown is a powerless relic of the old days and that Her Majesty is really just a kind-hearted person, even if her husband is admittedly a rabid racist and her son Charles talks to plants, then you're not going to get it. With that, bear, bear in mind what Jeff has said uh, on the orchestration of 9-11 and its cover-up. And I want to introduce a person who I believe deserves to be called the Chief Executive Officer of today's international terrorism. One would be pretty hard put to name another single individual who has done more than he over the past three decades to create, sponsor and protect international terrorism. Now, this biography here came out early this year. The New Citizen feature on Charles of Arabia, page four of our most recent New Citizen, and his ties to Saudi, Prince Bandar, Prince Turkey, and other kingpins of Al-Qaeda and ISIS terrorism, and reprints of, two part, of the two-part expose of Charles' sponsorship of Islamic terrorism published last year by our colleagues at EIR, William Wirtz and Richard Freeman in the United States, were already circulating in the UK before this book. London-based author Catherine Mayer felt compelled to protest in the book the charges levelled at Charles by EIR, which she footnoted explicitly. So let's take some of the evidence. Je Jeff gave you an overview of 9-11. In 2003, lawyers for families of 9-11 victims went to the UK to track down the activities of some of these individuals. In the 2005 book, Saudi Babylon, Torture, Corruption and Cover-Up Inside the House of Saud, by investigative reporter Mark Hollingsworth and Sandy Mitchell, a British citizen imprisoned and tortured in Saudi Arabia, tells what happened. Hollingsworth and Mitchell report on a meeting between the 9-11 family, lawyers and top officials of Scotland Yard. For those who don't know, Scotland Yard is the London Metropolitan Police. Quote, Prince Charles' relationships with prominent House of Saud members have created serious problems and obstacles to UK agencies investigating claims of Saudi financing of international terrorism, according to special branch sources. The delicacy and sensitivity of Prince Charles's friendships was raised during a meeting at New Scotland Yard in April 2003. Families of the victims of 9-11 had filed a lawsuit accusing some members of the House of Saud, notably Defence Minister Prince Sultan and the new UK Ambassador Prince Turkey, of supporting al-Qaeda in the past. 
Their lawyers were in Europe investigating allegations that senior Saudi royals had backed Islamic charities run by the government which funded the 9-11 hijackers. The meeting at New Scotland Yard was attended by Detective Chief Inspector Stephen Ratcliffe, the Special Branch Officer in charge of tracking terrorism financing, Peter Clark, National Director of Counter Countering Terrorist Funding, Robert Randall, a Police Liaison Officer, and the visiting lawyers. Alan Gerson, a lawyer for the 9-11 relatives, outlined their case and said that the Saudi royal family were put on notice in 1999 by US National Security Council officials in Riyadh that funds for Al-Qaeda came from Saudi Arabia. There were similar warnings to the Saudis in London as well, said Ratcliffe, although some of our regulatory agencies were not always up to scratch in tracing the money. Well... Have the UK authorities uncovered anything to show that the charities run by some members of the Saudi royal family were channeling money to terrorists? Asked Gerson. Ratcliffe looked hesitant and a little sheepish. Our ability to investigate the Saudis is very limited, he said. He then paused, looked across at a photograph of Prince Charles on the wall, raised his eyebrows and smiled knowingly without saying a word. He did not say anything, but the message was crystal clear when he looked at the picture, said a police officer who was present. It was Prince Charles's special relationship with the Saudis which was a problem. He gave no other reason why they were restricted, end quote. The Anglo-Saudi arms deal, al Yamama, was set up between Prince Bandar and Margaret Thatcher in 1985. Successive phases of the deal were negotiated over the ensuing decades right down till today. Prince Charles personally was a key figure in those successive phases of negotiation, working on it during his 12 official visits to Saudi Arabia and other visits, termed private. These were to Saudi Arabia, to Qatar, the other main financer of ISIS, and other Gulf states. William Wirtz and... and Richard Freeman documented Charles's role as the Queen's liaison to the Saudis for decades. According to Bandar's biographer, Charles has a deep-going fascination with Islam. If you look at it more closely, though, you see that his special fascination is with the bloodiest and most evil sect of Islam called Wahhabism. This is the official religion of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Wahhabism, which preaches that its adherents have a religious duty to kill non-believers, whether Christians, Jews, or members of Shiite or other non-Wahhabite tendencies in Islam. In the early 1990s, Charles persuaded King Fahd to contribute tens of millions of dollars to building mosques across the UK. Several of these became training grounds and launch pads for international terrorism. In the same early 1990s period, Charles became the official patron of the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, the OCIS. The Saudis, Qataris and other Gulf states have contributed somewhere around 100 million pounds to the OCIS. Uh, I'm, here are uh, the leading figures in the centre, often called Charles's OCIS. Virtually every one of them, uh, slide please, virtually every one of them has played a leading role in organising of financial, financing international terrorism. So in the, in the centre here is Charles during a February 2014 visit to Saudi Arabia where he performed a sword dance with members of the Saudi royal family. Just should mention that um, swords like that one are used often in Saudi Arabia in executions. So it wasn't exactly um, the best choice of attire. <laughs> um, surrounding him are board members and financial backers of the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, including members of the Faisal and Bin Laden families who have contributed to it. Each of the Persian Gulf figures pictured here is also implicated in financing or advocating terrorism. So going from the top to the bottom, starting on the left, 
you see at the top one, Prince Bandar bin Sultan. His biographer calls his friendship with Charles close. He was a wedding guest of Charles and Camilla. In 1990, Bandar contributed an estimated US 13 to 24.4 million dollars to the OCIS. At, Beha- at Bandar's behest, then King Fahd pledged $32.4 million donation from the kingdom to the centre. Bandar announced the gift at a 1997 private dinner with Charles. Former Saudi ambassador to Washington and intelligence chief, Bandar heads the Saudi Security Council. He and his wife have been implicated in funding the 9-11 attackers. He also arranged the first al Yamama deal, as I mentioned before. Print number two, Prince Turkey bin Faisal a member of the Board of Trustees of the OCIS and chair of its Strategic Advisory Committee. Another of Charles's wedding guests, he resigned as Director of Saudi General Intelligence uh, 10 days before 9-11. He was in that position from 1979 to September 1st, 2001. Turkey financed and organised the rise of Al-Qaeda in the 1980s, personally deploying Osama bin Laden. Prince Mohammed bin Faisal, number three, is another member of the Faisal clan which has sponsored the OCIS, full brother of Prince Turkey. He heads the Dar al Mal al Islami Trust, the DMI banking group, which financed Al Qaeda according to a 2002 report to the UN Security Council. Mohammed was named in a 9 11 family member lawsuit in 2002. Prince Abdulaziz bin Abdullah, Bottom left. Deputy Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Centennial Fund, established by Prince Charles in 2004. He is an expert on Syria, where Saudi financing and radical Sunni opposition groups, out of which ISIS emerged, is notorious. Now, starting on the top right, number five, Abdullah Omar Nasif, co-founder of the OCIS and chairs its Board of Trustees. He was the Secretary General of the Muslim World League in 1983 to 1993, at the height of the Anglo-American backing for the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. King Faisal, which is the father to Turkey and Muhammad, had set up the Muslim World League in 1962 to coordinate Wahhabite propaganda and subversive activity. The MWL spawned significant parts of today's global jihadi apparatus. Nasif also chaired the Pakistan-based Rabita Trust, a uh, Muslim World League financial project. In the 1980s, Nasif co-created Maktab al-Kidamat, the backbone organization of the Arab Afghani Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which in 1989 changed its name to Al-Qaeda. According to the 9-11 family suit, Nasif knowingly funded Al-Qaeda through the Muslim World League, Rabita Trust, and the International Islamic Relief Organization. Next is number six, Yusuf Al-Qaradawi, formerly a board member of Charles's OCIS and a founder of the OCIS. Uh, This Qatar-based spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood issued fatwas for the o which is a religious edict or uh, religious um, calling for the overthrow and assassination of Libyan head of state Muammar Gaddafi, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, and in July of 2012 he threatened the assassination of Egyptian leader General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who's the now, now the president. Next, Abdul Hassan al al Ali Al Nadwi, co founder and first chairman of the OCIS. Nadwi has been a founding member of the Muslim World League since 1962. And down the bottom right, the Bin Laden family, shown here as Muhammad Bin Laden, a very, very close friend of King Faisal. The, the Osama, the Bin Laden family was among the Saudi, Qatari, and Kuwaiti private donors of approximately $70 million to Charles's OCIS. 
Osama bin Laden was recruited by Charles's friend and wedding guest, Prince Turkey bin Faisal, to set up the Maktab al Kidamat network, the future Al-Qaeda. His financial network included dozens of City of London banks and corporations, according to a 2001 French parliamentary investigation. Now, I don't have the time today for reviewing the history of the creation of the Saudi Kingdom, uh, from go to woe, how the British Empire did that. Suffice it to know that modern Saudi Arabia is a fusion of two distinct entities. One is the ruling, westernised and generally corrupt seven to 9,000 princes, who are all descendants from the founding warlord, Abdulaziz ibn Saud, and his 22 official wives and countless concubines. Now, the uh, second element <coughs> is the Wahhabite ideology. In the 18th century, Ibn Saud's ancestor had allied the family with the fanatical founder of the Wahhabist ideology of death to all non-believers. The British sponsored this alliance then and thereafter, down until today. In 1922, then Secretary of State of the Colonies, Winston Churchill, yeah, Winston Churchill put Ibn Saud on the payroll of the British Empire at £100,000 a year, later writing that, quote, my admiration for him was deep because of his unfailing loyalty to us, end quote. In 1927, Ibn Saud, by treaty with Britain, ceded control over the emerging state's foreign policy to Britain. Meanwhile, the king struck a pact with the al Sheikh clan, descendants of the founder of Wahhabism, giving them the power to administer and oversee religion and law in the, in the kingdom. This alliance remains in effect today. The powerful Saudi Ministry of Religious Affairs is the de facto headquarters of the Wahhabites in Saudi Arabia. They pour billions of dollars into foreign charities and other religious institutions to establish Wahhabist schools worldwide. The Saudi Ministry of Religious Affairs set up schools in, or what's called madrasas, all over the Middle East, South Asia, the Caucasus, the Balkans and elsewhere. They have done the same thing in Britain itself with the patronage of Prince Charles by building all those mosques. It's important to note that not every mosque has become a terrorist centre, of course, and even those which have uh, been infiltrated or taken over by terrorists have partially reclaimed these centres of actual religions of peace. And it's a process is a complex one. But indeed, one of the things that about which there is, you know, in great concern now in Britain and globally is the degree of Islamophobia unleashed in the wake of these types of operations because of the protection and sponsorship of these terrorist training mosques by Charles, by MI5, MI6, agents of which, by the way, Charles is the official patron. He's the official patron for these security agencies. Um, I want to show you just a, a prime example of how this has worked, and that is the infamous Finsbury Park Mosque in North London. The key figure was Abu Hamza al-Masri, born in Egypt. He became a UK citizen in 1986. In 1993, he went to live in Afghanistan, and while there, he got blown up whilst training with the Mujahideen forces. He lost his hands and one eye in the explosion. Consequently, he returned to London, becoming a preacher and recruiter of young Muslims to violent jihad. As a result of his reputation as a good orator and because he offered to work for free, he was hired to preach at the Finsbury Park Mosque in 1997 by the management committee of that mosque. Once he got in, however, he took it over, throwing out the existing imams by force using thugs, many of whom had come to him after serving overseas as jihadists in Algeria with the GIA or in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. 
On dozens of occasions, the management committee pursued legal avenues, avenues to remove Hamza from this mosque and asked the police to intervene to remove him. Hamza was not touched. In fact, he boasted that his activity was sanctioned by the British government and by MI5. Hamza used the mosque as a recruitment centre for hundreds upon hundreds of young British Muslims, twisting them into becoming suicide bombers and foreign jihadists. His hate-filled disciples can be found all over the world. From 1997 to 2006, Hamza established the infrastructure in the UK that helped finance and prepare jihadists in North London, helping them get out of the country across to Pakistan for training and in several cases helped young recruits to get to places like Yemen and Israel to carry out terrorist attacks or suicide bombings. The mosque itself became a training facility, not just preaching jihad, but also stockpiling weapons and becoming a local centre for organised crime. Now, Hamza was arrested and jailed in the UK in 2005, extradited to the United States in 2012, where he is serving a life sentence for his role in inciting and being involved in terrorism. His network has been implicated in dozens of attacks, including 9-11, the 7 July 2005 London subway bombings known as 7-7, which killed 52 people and wounded another 700, and more recently, the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, carried out by disciples of one of Abu Hamza's closest associates. Now, did the intelligence agencies, MI5, MI6, really not know what was going on? Of course they did. Abu Hamza himself testified in a US court that he had been working for MI5. Now, EIR has documented, documented this long ago, well before 9-11. On 21 January 2000, an EIR memorandum addressed to the US then Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, titled, Put Britain on the List of States Sponsoring Terrorism, pointed not only to Hamza, as a terrorist operating within Britain, but also to others, such as Omar Bakri Muhammad, who from London started calling on jihadists to begin terrorist attacks on US targets in 1998. The EIR memorandum documented cases where 11 nations had protested the UK's protection of terrorists who were using London as their headquarters for global operations. In Britain, the arrangement between the security services on the one side and radical jihadists and terrorist supporters on the other even has a name, at least in the security circles. They call it the Covenant of Security. Author and investigative uh, journalist Mark Curtis, author of the book Secret Affairs, Britain's Collusion with Radical Islam, writes about this agreement. Quote, Abu Hamza, the former imam at the Finsbury Park Mosque, said at his trial at the Old Bailey that he believed a deal operated whereby his activities would be tolerated as long as they targeted only foreign soil. He recalled how Scotland Yard's intelligence wing, the special branch, assured him that you don't have anything to worry about as long as we don't see blood on the streets. In August of the same year, Omar Bakri Muhammad, who had established the militant al muhajirun organization, described how, quote, I work here in accordance with the covenant of peace which I made with the British government when I got political asylum, end quote. Nine months later, he said in a further interview that the British government knows who we are. MI5 has interrogated us many times. I think now we have something called public immunity. So that's the excerpt from Mark Curtis. Sean O'Neill's book, The Suicide Factory, mentions another account of this covenant. Quote, the clerics all claimed that Islamic radicals felt safe in London as they were protected by what they called the covenant of security. This, they explained, was a deal whereby if extremist groups pledged not to stage attacks or cause disruption in the UK, the police and intelligence agencies left them alone. 
Now, this era when British intelligence benevolently oversaw the training of hundreds and thousands of terrorists, as long as they didn't carry out attacks in Britain, is, has been over for some time. Now, former MI6 head John Sawyers bemoans that there are several thousand terrorists in the UK ready to launch a ghastly 7-7 style attack, quote unquote, referring to the London subway bombings at any time. That, of course, is just what the Crown needs, to establish a full police state in Britain parallel to what is being worked on in Australia. Ever since the Snowden revelations that the electronic spy centres of the US National Security Agency and the British Cheltenham GCHQ and their Five Eyes cousins here in Australia and New Zealand monitor virtually every single individual in these countries, it is no longer credible for MI5 to, and others to claim that we didn't know anything about large terror operations or planned terror attacks before they happen. Lo and behold, MI5, ASIO and their cousins inform us that these are, there are countless lone wolves out there who are part of no network that could be surveilled and whose attacks therefore cannot be stopped. Manharon Monis of the Sydney Siege was just such a lone wolf, if you believe ASIO. The only problem being that ASIO had had an intimate, if complicated, relation with Monas for a long time, as they do with all of these so-called lone wolves. Among other things, Monas felt himself abused and harassed by ASIO. As you heard yesterday from our British, uh, our British friends, the May 7 elections in Britain have the potential to be a watershed, both for Britain and the world, if they result in a Labour-Scottish National Party coalition committed to Glass-Steagall, to ending British, the British nuclear tripwire called Trident, and to ditching the Thatcher, Blair, Cameron policies of brutal austerity. So what do you want to bet that this period between now and then will see terrorist attacks in Britain, which would benefit the incumbent City of London, utterly crown-dominated conservative government of David Cameron? To forestall that, and to give our poor British cousins and ourselves a fighting chance of electing a decent government committed to Glass-Steagall, national banking and an alliance for the BRICS, it is a high priority to put Charles in the dock. And that begins with exposing his role far and wide as we are doing here today and will continue to do so. Thank you. Okay, we have about 10 to 15 minutes worth of questions on uh, on this subject. So if you'd like to come up here to the microphone, ask away. Okay. okay. Um, just a question about the upcoming elections in the UK. What's being done to actually um, counteract the so-called terrorist attacks that might be planned to get Cameron back in? Are they actually warning people about the expected terrorist attacks so that the people then are aware that that might happen and they won't fall for that little ploy? The media in Britain, like the media here in Australia, have bombarded the population with this belief that lone wolf attacks are inevitable and cannot be prevented. This is what MI6 has been, you know, hitting the media every day saying we, we're going to have a Charlie Hebdo or a Sydney siege and there's nothing we, that can be done. Now, to those we've spoken to, uh, they know the penetration of MI5, MI6 into, into these layers of radical, uh, radical terrorist circles inside London. They understand that this has been an ongoing problem and the precedent of the Finsbury Park Mosque to many is, is very clear. The failure of the intelligence agencies to do anything about it, but it's not a failure, it was a deliberate policy not to intervene. So that, that to some is clear, 
But the, the biggest trouble is with the mass media, without a voice like us to say and call, call it for what it is, you know, they're going to be manipulated. And I, I think I'll just come back to it. Also, what Jeff, what Jeff mentioned about the, pre, you know, the prescient forecast that, and warning that Linda LaRouche made in January of 2001, both to the security, uh, to the Senate uh, committee on the Ashcroft nomination, but also in a webcast of that month. Had people listened to him when that, and recognised the historical moment that uh, we were in at that point with the global financial crisis, with the weakening of the, the powers that be in, in the city of London and Wall Street, they would have seen the, that we were about to see another Reichstag fire event. So, so the, the indicators are there, and the point is to make a loud uh, ruckus about this now and make sure that everyone knows that they're not going to get away with it again. So... So for the for the ben, for the benefit of the camera, we have a, a member that's asking how many ASIO agents we have in our conference today. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Well, I hope there's a quite a few because they would learn something. <laughs> I'm just curious to know why the um, the chap from Kingsley Park Mosque broke the covenant of seal. Uh, did the, the the agreement was there was to be no attacks on on uh, the soils of Great Britain, why did he go against that? Oh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Well, one was, when you're dealing with a radical fundamentalist, you know, sect, a cult like this, um, it's a bit like a Frankenstein monster. You can use it and manipulate it, but it can also um, attack the host. Uh, and, uh, I mean, when... Uh, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan occurred, a lot of these circles which were, you know, had made this pact decided it was time to break it uh, and uh, attack inside Britain. And so that was the, the turning point there. I, I had another point, but I, I lost it, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> oh, I remember now. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that even within... Uh, Saudi Arabia, it's not black and white because there was this pact made between the radical forces of Ibn Saud and the Wahhabist fanatics. Um, now, when Ibn Saud took control of Saudi Arabia in the 1920s, he recruited an army of 150,000 soldiers called the Ikhwan, or the Brotherhood, and they were ruthless. But when Ibn Saud turned around and made these deals with Britain, which are the foreign infidels... Uh, the, the foreign crusaders, because they're all Christians over there in Britain, um, it, it upset his fanatic army. So he had to resort to the British help to put down the fundamentalist forces inside Saudi Arabia that he used to gain control of the, of the peninsula. So you've got this uh, complicated situation where there's extremities, but it's all overseen at the top by the, the these these um, quasi-monarchies, but they're all looking up to the top monarchy, which is the Windsor family, because they're the ones who have been in control for a thousand plus years. Well, not the Windsors, but the, the model. Uh, the question was, did, uh, just on Ibn Saud putting down his forces, did Hitler do the same thing by using the army to put down the brown shirts? In all honesty, I don't know, because I haven't looked at that history. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to comment on the parallels, but um, but it, yeah, I mean, as a technique, and when you have a, a dictator in control who wants to hang on to it, they'll um, they'll throw anyone under a bus. Um, um, okay, seeing that you're talking about security in Australia and all the rest of it, uh, uh, something came to mind just a few minutes ago in my head. Um, regarding security, because you were talking about security in Australia. Um, now, I could be wrong, so please correct me if I am. Um, the next lot of new television sets coming to this country, the latest TV, um, is going to have cameras and microphones in houses. So, if that's going to happen, how can we remove those from our TV systems or 
what, what is your, uh, okay. Do you know anything about it? And if so, can you enlighten me on this, what we can do? Because this is something a bit too much for me to take. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean? I have to buy a new TV soon, so I'm a bit concerned. <laughs> I, well, I'm not an electrician, I don't know how to pull apart a TV, but I'll use this occasion to make a plug. If you're worried about your TV, throw it out, get the subscription to EIR or the alert service. 